I'm Mikhail Komarov, an Elf Foundation Chairman and a co-founder member of Freetown. What I'm going to tell about is how to make e-voting protocols comply with the currently existing legal requirements to verify the voter eligibility by verifying their ID. Let's consider some particular voting case and let this case to be statewide elections. Statewide elections require for the officials to be sure that the voter is eligible. The simplest way to do that is to check their ID. Since this is also required legally, well, we can't ignore that. Next comes the necessity to avoid vote duplication and proxy voting. Then, a ballot box non-mailability, which would allow us to trust voting results, right? And finally, <clears throat> there is a requirement to avoid disclosure of voters' identity using their ballot only. Well, we can't let anyone know whom voted for whom, but we need a valid way to see valid results. We're not the only ones who do that kind of e-voting, right? Well, exactly. There is a related background. First of all, this background is about five counties in several states, for example, Utah, which attempt to legislate e-voting happened back in 2019, and it wasn't a huge success. Then, thanks to this, MIT released a paper criticizing e-voting, which, well, in my opinion, is a complete failure. Such a paper induced a massive amount of challenge attempts, including challenge attempts from Freedom community, uh, more than 40 attempts, actually. And most of them were pretty successful, but unfortunately purely theoretical. Now we think the time for practical challenges come. What makes this particular solution I'm presenting so special? Why have we chosen such particular design? And, well, there are several aspects of that. Uh, some of them require special protocols, some of them do not. Well, let's iterate over them. You know? First of all, uh, such an aspect is, well, centralized voter registration. There is nothing special about it. It can be handled without any special protocols. Well, without any protocols, actually. Just make a list of eligible voters and you're good. Then, non malleable ballot box. There is no need for any special kind of protocol in here as well. Any public database works fine. Just... Just use it. But when it comes to ballot verification, it is required to keep the voter ballot connection untraceable. Unfortunately, existing solutions rely on voting data search brute force complexity, which is too weak for statewide elections. In the same time, we can't let blame voter for their choice, right? Exactly. So here is where zero knowledge solutions come to the rescue. They allow to keep the voter ballot connection private. How in particular? How such a zero knowledge protocol will work? Well, let's iterate over all the protocol steps. First of all, registration. The voter has to generate their public identifier. It's, well, this happens to be key pair, a public and a private cryptographic keys. A private key should be kept private, and the public one can be shown to the world. Then, <clears throat> a voter needs to provide registering officials with their public key for the officials to put them into the eligible voters registry. Well, in case the voter is eligible, of course, just check their ID and make sure the voter is eligible. The eligibility is supposed to be checked with ID validation, that's right. This has to be done by registered officials, surely. Okay, we got our voter checked and registered. Next step, voting itself. Uh, okay, let's consider voting, voter which wants to vote. <laughs> yeah, but it is also required to keep their vote private. What else should we do? Let's encrypt the vote. Yeah. And um, how could we count the votes afterwards then? Uh, decrypting them so everyone could see whom voted for whom or make someone responsible for keeping the secret? No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we need a special kind of encryption in here. A homomorphic one. <laughs> When I was doing a test pitch of this, <laughs> I've been asked by non-technical folks, uh, homo white? Uh, yeah, well, I guess a little bit of explanation on what is this about is required. So let's imagine we have some number A and some number B. Let's say they both equal two. Now let's multiply them. We got like four as a result. Now let's consider the same numbers. Let's encrypt them and then multiply what we got as a result of encryption. And then decrypt with the usual encryption uh, what we got as a result of multiplication. What we're going to end up with? 
will end up with some garbage number. Uh, it is supposed to be garbage. It is encrypted, right? Yes. But <clears throat> let's uh, do all the same steps with homomorphic encryption. Same numbers, a, b equal to, multiplication equals 4. Let's encrypt both of those numbers, like a and b. Let's then multiply the result of their encryption, homomorphically, encrypt, encry homomorphically encry uh, encrypted numbers. And then let's decrypt uh, homomorphically um, the result of the multiplication. What will it result into? Exactly, 4. <laughs> Magic, you say? No, it's just a math of a special kind. Don't burn me as a witch. I'm not a witch, please. So what does it bring to us? Well, easy. We will not be required to decrypt votes while tallying them. So we can simply tally encrypted votes and get a valid result. Now, let's get back to voting. After we got the vote homomorphically encrypted, well, there will be a button which makes things easier for the voters. So nothing to be... Uh, nothing to be scared of. Uh, we need the voter to generate a ZK proof of being put into eligible voters registry. Uh, well, this gets done with a simple button push as well, so there's no problem with that again. After that, we need the voter to publish his vote and newly generated eligibility proof. Okay, this concludes the voting process. Let's get to counting votes. Uh, Elections officials declare the voting is over and no more votes, no more votes are accepted. Then, election officials compile published encrypted eligible only votes together with, with a simple button click, surely. And then officials uh, decrypt the compiled result with government managed private key, which allows to decrypt only results but not individual votes. So it is still unknown to anyone whom voted for whom, but. <clears throat> elections officials got valid and provable results. So, voila! Personal voter information remains private, no public connection between the voter and the ballot, and voting results are public, and voting results are verifiable. I guess that's it. Thank you. And maybe questions? So, any questions on that, please? while uh, Michael is available uh, remotely. Michael, your camera is off. All right, remember, who Michael, are you and who do you represent? Your camera is off. Uh, Raphael, Minnesota Blockchain Initiative and uh, blockchain cryptocurrency investor. Hello, um, Minnesota. <laughs> uh, we connected earlier, and I had a chance to, uh, to hear a little bit about your project, and it's really exciting to see the open source, the open source democratized nature of it. My question is, there's an assumption here that the person voting is a, a verified individual. How do we hold hands with the government there to let them say that, hey, the system that you have that currently works is not something that we're trying to replace, but we're trying to supplement in addition to a partnership? How do you sort of calm the fears of the government that says, hey, you're trying to bring in a third party system for all intents and purposes, right? It's not government owned. How do you convince these governments to partner with this to realize that it's an additional security layer rather than a security threat? Yes, a great question. Um, obviously, let's separate the two things. Number one is the theoretical solution that has been developed already, which uh, you have seen as an example. And a completely different thing is implementation. Right? It's a long and hard process of adapting what the government and the legislatures are used to today to what is possible. It will take some time. We actually have some people in the audience that are practitioners in uh, government elections, and they are the ones that will be looking at this first to identify what steps are required, exactly as you're suggesting, uh, in order for this to be universally accepted as a good solution. Now, some of the arguments uh, are open source. Anybody can come and audit the uh, smart contracts that are involved here, right? Anybody can do that. And then it's 100% transparent. What we're also trying to do is to minimize the amount of changes that uh, local election officials will have to take into account. So again, the adaptation of this technology is a, a time-consuming process. How exactly this will be done and how we will convince the government that this is better 
in many ways than what is practiced today? It's a great question. And we are here to work with local government officials and election officials to hear their concerns and to address them one by one. But again, the system that you just saw is designed to clearly say that this is open, anybody can go look at the code. It is end-to-end -end verified and cryptographically protected, right, using all the powers of blockchain. And so with that background, what specific steps are needed remains to be seen. I'm hoping that some of the people in the audience will tell us later about that. Any more questions, please? I think uh, we'll, we'll need to move on to the next speaker. Thank you.